These are the 10 things that you need to know before the 2025 NBA season begins. Number one, a comeback season from Damian Lillard will make the Bucks a top two team in the Eastern Conference. Last season, due to injuries, a late trade, and some family matters off the court, Damian Lillard saw a downtick in both scoring production and efficiency. But as the season went on and he played himself into shape, there was a noticeable difference. In the first round series against the Indiana Pacers, Damian Lillard was right back to his 32 points a game when he was available available in the series. But because of a tweak in his Achilles and Giannis not suiting up for a single minute, Milwaukee fell in six games. Now with a full off season to come to terms with who he's playing with, where he's playing and who he's playing for, I would expect Damian Lillard to get right back to his Portland Trailblazers form. Now I'm not saying he's going to be averaging 32 points a game like he did in 2023, but what I am saying is he's going to get back to that kind of efficiency. And perhaps even better than that, now he's alongside Giannis. The pick and roll chemistry between Lillard and Antetokounmpo got better as the season went on. As in a game versus the Clippers, they made history as the pair combined for 69 points and 21 assists. First, you're going to see a three-man game as Lopez is in a DHO and gives to Giannis, who will then give to Lillard for an open triple for Dame. Now it's Dame who gives to Giannis, creating the one-on-one matchup against Zubac. And because Man doesn't want to double off of Dame, Giannis gets two. Here, Giannis doesn't even have to commit to setting the screen. As Man moves out of the way, basically handing Dame another open three. Here in the high screen and roll, both defenders go to Lillard, leaving the most dominant roller the game has ever seen all by himself for two. Then in the same action, both defenders are scared of the three ball again, leaving Giannis open. And this time, Dame finds him on the alley-oop. This is a play that I really like as this time it's an inverted pick and roll and Lillard fakes that he's going to collect the ball and instead he sets the screen allowing Giannis to get the open driving lane. Then down the stretch of the game, the Bucks leaned on the Dame Giannis pick and roll. Now with Giannis getting too many looks, the Clippers change their coverage as here only one goes to Dame. But Dame Dame is good enough to notice that Amir Coffey is playing him hard right, so Lillard steps back left into space and knocks it down. After seeing this, the Clippers were forced to send an extra defender into the two-man game, which this time leaves Brook Lopez open on the weak side, and Dame finds him for three. As soon as you try and send extras to the two-man game, you're going to leave capable three-point shooters wide open. Here, Giannis sets a great screen, allowing Dame the space for a three-ball over Zubat. And then to end the game, it's a dribble handoff from Giannis that gives Dame a sliver of daylight, who able to connect on a tough triple. With Lillard bouncing back to Portland form, along with the chemistry of Giannis improving, this Bucks team is going to be incredibly difficult to beat when healthy. The second thing you need to know before the next NBA season starts is the fact that Ja Morant is coming to take his seat back from Anthony Edwards. To start the season, Ja Morant had to serve a 25-game suspension, but once he returned in mid-December, so did the Memphis Grizzlies. As over the nine games he was available for last season, the Grizzlies had a 6-3 and three record with victories coming over the Lakers, Pelicans, and Pacers. These numbers were particularly impressive when you see the Grizzlies' record without Jar, which was 21-52. and 52. It's easy to look at these numbers and say this is his impact, but truthfully, there's a lot more that goes into this conversation as we need to see some game footage. In his first game back after the 25-game suspension, he scored 34 points in only 35 minutes. As to start, he grabs the offensive rebound and then he's able to finish around Valanciunas for two. Then out on the run, he makes a perfectly timed pass to Zaire Williams for the finish. Then with the screen from Jaron Jackson Jr., he makes the cross-court pass to Aldama for a trip. Now he showed us why he's one of a kind, knifing his way through the defense, getting all the way to the basket for two. Coming off a of Bismack Biyombo screen, he hangs in the air to beat Zeller and then simply drops it in. His speed, even in his first game back, was impressive, as here he beats CJ and Jonas, drawing the foul and one. Then here his speed was too much for Alvarado, gliding to the basket for two. Then of course, it was the end of this game that we all remember. As first, Ja makes a play to the basket, using a spin and a floater to take the lead. Then tied at 111, Ja makes an incredible finish around Zion and Herb to retake the lead again. However, the Pelicans didn't blink, getting baskets after each of these shots. But with time running down and the ball in Morant's hands, he would decide this game. And did he ever, dropping in the game-winning basket in his return. This would then lead to the nine-game span of the Grizzlies' dominance. However, it was short-lived, as a shoulder injury would sideline Ja Morant for the rest of the regular season. Since Jar has been out, all the media attention he was getting went to Anthony Edwards and SGA. But I fully expect to see a healthy, motivated Jar Morant dominate the NBA once again, leading his Grizzlies to the top of the Western Conference once more. The third thing that you need to know before the next NBA season is just how dominant the Thunder will be. Of course, last season, the OKC Thunder became the youngest one seed in the history of the NBA. But over the course of the offseason, it's become clear that there are five key reasons as to why the Thunder will 
will do much better this coming season. The first reason is to do with SGA now being a top five player in the game. As last season, he averaged 30 points on 53% shooting. Again, it's just easy to mention stats, so I'll take a deeper dive using footage to prove my point. Here down one in Denver, Shea gets to a turnaround fadeaway and knocks it down for the game. Then against the Knicks in the garden, SGA made another fallaway shot for the win. His skill set in the mid range is deadly. And with the three ball getting better each season, SGA is so hard to guard. Now on the baseline with the bigger Palo Banquero, he creates the separation with a step back and knocks it down, sending Orlando home. You don't want to pick him up too early either, as here he loses bogey for a pull up triple. Even when the defense plays him well, it doesn't matter. Here finishing around two Kings defenders for two. Shea is methodical with the ball in hand, keeping in mind his direct matchup, here recognizing the bigger Harrison Barnes so he gets to a jump shot. But then with a smaller defender on him, he'll usually take them to the paint or just shoot over them. Here blowing by Dennis Schroeder for a throwdown. With more possessions with the ball in his hands without Giddy, look out for SGA next season. The second reason why the Thunder will be much better next season is because of the signing of Alex Caruso. Bringing in AC was a massive move that instantly raised the ceiling for this Thunder team. With Alex Caruso, you're getting one of, if not the best defensive guards in basketball to pair with Lou Dor. The defense from Caruso is a known strength of his, but it's what he did offensively for Chicago last season that was so important. Last season, Caruso was excellent from deep, shooting 40% from downtown, as here he knocks down the corner triple. It's unclear if they'll be starting AC or bringing him off the bench, but either way, what a weapon to have in either role. Here, DeRozan swings the ball to Caruso, and he's good enough to knock it down. But it wasn't just easy shots that he was making, as here to send the game to overtime against Milwaukee, he curls off a screen and knocks down the long ball. This wasn't a one-off either, as here against the Raptors, he gets the defensive stop on one end and makes the game-winning triple on the other. To get Caruso, the Thunder had to deal Josh Giddy in a straight swap, which was a massive win. Not to say Josh Giddy is a bad player by any stretch, it's just that he needs the ball to be effective within the team's offense. As if you look at the games where SGA was out and Giddy was the starting point guard, he had great games. But with the ball going to SGA more and more, Josh Giddy found himself in a replaceable position, as his three-point shooting numbers of a low average, and then when you look at the lack of defense, it wasn't hard to see why the Thunder felt the need to swap him for Alex Caruso. Then the third reason why the Thunder will be much better next season is to do with the experience from J-Dub as he enters year three. Jalen Williams was the second best player on the OKC Thunder last season, and if I had to pick the most improved player coming into this season, I'd pick him. As in his second season as a pro, he was able to put up 19-4-4 four four on an effective 54% shooting, while also having the tools to one day become an elite defender. On offense, he's basically just good at everything. Shooting 42% from deep, connecting on mid-range hits at 46%, while also being comfortable getting to the cup thanks to his handles. Here he does just that, using his ball handle to get deep into the paint for two. Then out on the break, he's able to use a quick crossover to beat the Kings defense back for two more. Now he'll again use his ball handle, this time creating the separation needed to knock down a mid-range jump shot. Here in a tight game against the Pelicans, he's able to bail out SGA with a pull-up three. But it's not just off the bounce where he can score, as here he knocks down the catch and shoot three from Giddy. With Jalen Williams being a Swiss Army knife for this OKC Thunder team, he's definitely a reason why the Thunder will be great next season. The fourth reason why the Thunder will be dominant again next season is because of Chet Holmgren's two-way play. On both sides of the ball, Chet had an elite rookie season, putting up 16, 8, and 2 on 53% shooting, while also swatting away 2.3 shots per game. What makes him such a perfect fit on the offensive side of the ball is his three-point shooting, as he's able to knock down deep balls at a 36% clip. Then when we talk about his defense, it kind of went overlooked last season, just because of what his fellow rookie Victor Webanyama was doing. But the fact of the matter is, this kind of shot blocking as a rookie, along with the efficient scoring, is not normal. Here, the Mavericks set up the role for Derek Lively. However, Chet is right there to send him back with two hands. Then later in the game, Dallas tried to lure him out, and even though it looked like it had worked, he was still able to recover back to Washington to get the block. Then offensively, he can do it all. Here, knocking down the long ball from Dort, and then here with Sabonis, he's able to use some tough footwork to get a fadeaway in the mid-range, which he drills. And then, like any other big man in this league, Chet can also be an inside presence in the paint. Here, finishing on the alley-oop. Then reason number five why the Thunder will be so dominant again next season is because of the signing of Isaiah Hartenstein. I Hart made a name for himself with the Knicks in last season's playoffs. Hartenstein does everything apart from shooting three balls, as he's a great rebounder, 
rebounder, shot blocker, playmaker, and an elite screener. The rebounding in particular will be a huge asset for the Thunder next season because they rank 29th and 28th in offensive and defensive rebounding last season. In the second round series against Dallas, their lack of size was put on full display as the Mavericks continued to go to Gaffin and Lively in the pick and roll actions, exposing the Thunder's big man depth. But now with the front court of Holmgren and Hartenstein, this Thunder team, similar to the Boston Celtics, really don't have any weaknesses. From three-point shooting to overall scoring and defense, there's nothing the Thunder will struggle at next season as they're a complete team from top to bottom and should be the one seed again. The fourth thing you need to know before the next NBA season is how we might just be witnessing the first postseason that doesn't feature LeBron James, Stephen Curry, or Kevin Durant since 2004. Because of other rising teams in the Western Conference, which we'll get into more deeply later in the video, there's a high chance that the Lakers, Warriors, and Suns will all miss out on the postseason. Such a feat would truly mark the end of an era, and more importantly, a beginning of a new chapter. With Golden State failing to sign Paul George, losing Klay Thompson, and not being able to trade for Laurie Markkinen, they were not able to improve upon their roster in the offseason. For the Suns, the addition of Tyus Jones was an important one, but for me, if they bring him off the bench for Bradley Beal, the Suns will have the same issues as they had last season, with three ball-dominant scorers having to share one basketball. Then for the Lakers, they also did not improve upon their roster, deciding to run it back with a team that lost in the first round at full strength and is also getting older. Out of these three teams, I believe that the Suns have the highest chance to still make the playoffs due to Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, but out of the three teams, I'd give the Lakers the highest ceiling. As if JJ Reddick can figure out a strong offense for the Lakers, you can never count out LeBron James and Anthony Davis. The fifth thing you need to know before the next NBA season is how the Philadelphia 76ers are highly overrated. I know a lot of people will not agree with this take, but hear me out. I believe that this Sixers squad will only go as far as Joel Embiid takes them, which so far in his career is only as far as the second round. The addition of Paul George is an impactful one, but for me, it doesn't really move the needle. As if Embiid gets hurt or just isn't playing well, Paul George and Tyrese Maxey alone won't be good enough to beat the Bucks, Celtics, or Knicks. For this reason, I'd put the Sixers as the fourth best team in the Eastern Conference next season, even if they end up having a higher seed than that. Another factor that would, in my opinion, derail the 76ers' chance at a championship is if they elect Paul George to be the second option over Maxey. What this would do is stunt the growth that Tyrese made last year without James Harden, as instead of his 26 points a game that he averaged last season, those numbers would dwindle down to somewhere around 15 points a game. I know it makes more sense for the point guard to take the step back, but in this case, I just don't see this working out for the Sixers long term. As if you keep denying Tyrese Maxey the opportunity to become a real focal point within the team's offense, he's going to get sick of it at some point. Paul George has also not proven anything over Tyrese Maxey so far throughout his career, as for years now, he's either underperformed or not been healthy for the postseason. And as each season passes, the chances of him being able to put together a title-worthy playoff run become low lower and lower, and that's why I think the Sixers are overrated. The sixth thing you need to know before the next NBA season is how Zion Williamson is about to have a top 15 worthy season. Last season, we witnessed something extraordinary in the career of Zion Williamson. After the in-season tournament game against the Lakers, where they were ran off the floor, he was called out by the media regarding his weight. In the past, we've seen this story before, and what ends up happening is Zion just ignoring the media and nothing happening. But this time, he took it in his stride, as by the time the playing tournament rolled around, he was playing at an elite level on both sides of the floor. However, an injured hamstring right at the end of the game saw him miss out on the postseason, as the Pelicans were handled in four straight games by the OKC Thunder. The reports are that Zion has dropped so much weight in the offseason that he actually weighs around the same as he did in his college days. With a lighter frame, Zion will be quicker and in theory, much more durable. Also, the trade for DeJounte Murray has already yielded positive effects, as Zion has clearly been more motivated than ever to keep up with his fitness. If Zion comes into the season fit and healthy alongside the addition of Murray, I could definitely see the Pelicans being a top 5 team in the West next season if they also make a trade for a quality big man. The seventh thing that you need to know before the next NBA season is just how good the New York Knicks truly are. I am so incredibly high on this New York Knicks team coming into next season. First, I believe that Julius Randle only makes this team better and a 14 game stretch in January proves this point. As as soon as the Knicks traded for OG Ananobi and Randle was still healthy, the Knicks embarked on a 12 and 2 stretch. This run was powered by an elite defensive performance, holding opponents to 100 points per game, which in comparison was 10 points better than the top defense in the league over the whole of last season, which was the Minnesota Timberwolves. Their offense was also still good, scoring 115 points per game themselves. And Randall was a 
huge part in that, providing the offensive and defensive punch that the team needed. Without Julius Randle, this Knicks team was still good enough to do what they did in the postseason, but I have no doubt in my mind that if the team was fully healthy, that'd make the Eastern Conference Finals. And then to add to that, they traded for Mikel Bridges as he reunites with his former Villanova squad, which is going to give this team chemistry right from the get-go. While Mikel was often the Nets' top option, his efficiency last season wasn't where it needed to be. However, that doesn't matter now that he's with the Knicks. Just because of the fact that he was a number one option is all the Knicks need from him, as now he's going to be so comfortable as the third option. Then also pairing him with OG Ananobi is going to give them a very terrifying defensive tandem. And like Bridges, Ananobi can also knock down some outside shots. Then to have Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo now coming off the bench is incredible, as these two were crucial to the Knicks postseason run, and now with valuable minutes under their belts, they're going to be invaluable coming off the bench. With Brunson emerging as one of the top 10 players in the league, and all the right pieces around him, the rest of the Eastern Conference should be worried. His ability to score inside considering his height, paired with his elite ability to shoot the ball, makes Brunson virtually unguardable at times. And one of those times was during last season's playoffs, as Brunson scored 210 points over a five-game span, which was the most in a five-game stretch since Michael Jordan back in 1993. He was able to do this by getting to the spots where Brunson knows he can make shots, while also getting to the free throw line at an above average rate. Game 4 in Philadelphia was his best performance, dropping 47 points and 10 assists as the 76ers had no answer for his relentless offensive onslaught. He started the game by scoring the first 7 points for the Knicks, as here he comes off the Hartenstein screen for 3. Then out on the run, the ball finds Brunson, who uses a tough Euro step to score 2 more. Brunson is also surprisingly quick, here beating Embiid off the bounce. Here with a quick change of speed, he catches Kelly Oubre off guard, getting all the way to the basket for 2. He can even score with his back to the basket. Here recognizing the strength mismatch with Tyrese Maxey, getting two with the fallaway jumper. On this play, the 76ers had all the time in the world and already knew what was about to happen and still couldn't stop it, as Brunson floats at home. Then with the bigger Tobias Harris, Brunson uses an up fake to draw the contact, drawing the foul and one. Throughout the series, Jalen Brunson began to attack Joel Embiid more and more in the pick and roll, here getting to the open mid-range jumper. This move against Tobias Harris was dirty, as once Harris thinks he's got him beat, Brunson just does this. In this game, the Knicks needed every point Brunson was giving them. Here, getting three the old-fashioned way against the Anthony Melton. This play matched up one-on-one -on -one with Embiid was incredible, even getting a one-legged floater to drop. At the end of the game, Brunson called his own number time and time again, as New York took a 3-1 lead in the series. For people to say the Knicks don't have a real superstar on the roster, to me, is a horrible take. As in this game alone, JB showed the NBA world why he's a legitimate number one option. As long as Julius Randle is okay being the second option on offense, this Knicks team will be good enough to beat anybody in a seven game series next season. The eighth thing that you need to know before the next NBA season is just how good the CP3 Wemby pairing will really be. Even last season, Victor Wembanyama was a top 20 player in the league, posting impressive rookie averages of 21.4 points, 10.6 rebounds, and a league leading 3.6 blocks per game. His points per game could have been even higher too if he had a real point guard next to him, as there were times where his teammates either couldn't get him the ball or didn't notice he was open. But now with arguably the greatest passer in the history of basketball with the point guard, I don't see this happening very much next season. Of course, when you're 7 foot 5, finishing is going to be a strength of yours. But it's not just right at the cup where Wemby's able to finish plays. As here with Aaron Gordon, he uses a quick in and out dribble and a bump to create the separation needed to bank it off the glass for two. Here, Jamal Murray tries to make the outlet pass, but Wemby's right there to pick it off, as he then goes coast to coast for a nasty slam. Victor is so good around the basket, as all you've got to do is throw it up in the general area, and chances are he's going to throw it down. As now it's Vassell who knives his way through the defense to draw the contest over Rudy Gobert, which frees up Webb and Yama for the alley-oop slam. Also, the addition of Harrison Barnes is an important one, as it not only adds another vet to the locker room, but it also gives them more defense, as the Spurs defense last season was terrible. For me, I'm high on the San Antonio Spurs coming into next season, as if Chris Paul can still pass the basketball and Wemby takes a leap in his game, the Spurs have a real chance 
chance to make the playoffs over teams like Golden State, the Lakers, and Suns. The ninth thing you need to know before the next NBA season is that even though Denver lost KCP, that's still the team to beat out West. Even after losing Bruce Brown and KCP over the last two off seasons, this Nuggets team is still good enough to go all the way, and I'll show you why. First, Nikola Jokic is still the best player in the world as he won his third MVP with averages of 26, 12, and 9 on 58% shooting. Then when you pair that playmaking ability with the athleticism of Aaron Gordon and the shooting of MPJ, Jokic still has his go-to guys to get the ball to when he's double teamed. And perhaps his best passing option is Jamal Murray, who's a bona fide scorer in his own right. As in the series against the Lakers, he was unstoppable, averaging 24 points, 7 assists, and a block, helping the Nuggets to a gentleman sweep of the Lakers. However, Jamal Murray was again dealing with injuries last season, as the lower leg issues saw a downtick in his efficiency as he only shot 40% from the floor in the playoffs, down from his 47% in the championship year. The addition of Russell Westbrook will help them get out and run with the second unit, but what it won't do is fill the hole of KCP, as that duty will likely go to the third year player, Christian Brown. If Brown can shoot a better percentage from three, to at least become a threat from deep, Denver will be in good shape, as he virtually does everything else. For the Nuggets to win another title, a lot more is going to have to swing their way than before. But that doesn't mean it's over. As with Jokic playing MVP level ball, a healthy Jamal Murray, and Aaron Gordon locking up on defense and finishing at the rim, Denver will remain a force in the Western Conference. Then the 10th thing you need to know before the start of the next NBA season is how the Celtics are still the best team in the league. Even though I think the Celtics will get off to a rocky start without KP, because of the injury Porzinga suffered in the playoffs last season, the Celtics have already announced that KP won't be seeing the court until the new year. With little bench depth at the big man position, the Celtics could start slow next season, as Boston would be relying on a near 40-year-old Al Horst for to start games, along with Luke Cornett or Xavier Tillman coming off the bench, which won't bode well against other dominant front courts in the East, such as the Bucks and the Sixers. But as long as the Celtics are around the three seed once he returns, they will be fine come playoff time, if healthy, of course. As last season, the starting lineup of Drew, D. White, Brown, Tatum, and KP was the best in the league, outscoring opponents by 11 points per game. As with this starting lineup, they have every asset covered, being able to play elite defense and offense. Did I forget to mention an important thing that we all need to know before next season, or is my list valid? Let me know in the comments below.